Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. Before I introduce my guest today, let me give you a little context. Recently, a hot topic that has been all over the place is the idea of professionals who want to become not just experts in the field, because you already are, but becoming the go-to thought leader. How to get invited to speak on panels, podcasts, roundtables, lunch and learns, conferences, media interviews, all that good stuff. And as we all know, it is not enough just to be the expert who is smart, but kind of dry, right? That gets you maybe invited once because you're known for your expertise, but not invited back. People need to know that you're someone who's informative and interesting and, dare I say, charismatic enough that they want to invite you back again and again. So my guest today is somebody who on first thought you may not think is the typical mold fitter for a speaking to influence guest, but boy, does he know a lot about this topic. So pay attention because he's going to share lots of great tips and we're going to have fun in the process. My guest today is Matt Eisman. Hi, Matt. Welcome to the show. Oh, Laura, it's so great to be here. I, uh, I And I love this. I love this topic. I love speaking to influence. And no, I'm not in the C-suite, but I do speak for a living. So I do feel like this is a topic I can really, really sink my teeth into. And we're going to do exactly that. Now, okay, everybody out there, if you're thinking, wait a minute, why do I know that name? Why, why do I, I think I recognize that voice. Why do I know that voice? It's because you've probably heard him say something more like this. Hello, America, and welcome to American Ninja Warrior. I'm Matt Eisman, and today we won't just be tackling obstacles. We'll be speaking to influence. It's going to be action-packed. I love it. Yes. Okay, so for the <laughs> that's last- That's my party <laughs> trick, Laura. <laughs> that's why I invited you. We're kind of done. We could just end the episode right here. That was awesome. For the last 15 years, Matt has been the co-host of the ever-popular TV show, American Ninja Warrior. He's also a professional stand-up comic, as if you couldn't tell, and an extremely popular <laughs> keynote and corporate events speaker, hosting events like upcoming Arnold Schwarzenegger's Austrian World Summit for Climate Change. Just, you know, little soirees along those lines. Did I get all that right, Matt? That that is it sounds so much more impressive when you say it, Laura. I love that. <laughs> Am I hired? I love hearing the hearing the especially the Schwarzenegger part. Come on, Laura, you gotta tell them about it. We're saving the earth. Yes, yes, and we're gonna save people's people's spirits today. Yes. As far as just uh, adding a little bit of levity along with content, really important. By the way, that's not info light. There's a difference. And tell me if you agree with this map. Difference between info light and infotainment. Infotainment to me is solid information start to finish, but where you actually enjoy the learning process because it has a little entertainment value to it. Info light is a lot of fluff that may make you laugh along the way, but there's not a truckload of value of it. We're going for door number one, yes? Uh, always, and, and I think that's one of the things people get confused about because so often the way we speak is dictated by what we've seen. And you think of you know news broadcasters or professors and giving these sort of solemn intonations. And there's an idea when you're in a position of power and prestige that you conduct yourself in a certain way, and you do. But there's also a part of if you wanna connect with an audience, what I have found is an audience connects with auth authenticity. So the more you can introduce your personality, the more you can be not just the CEO, but a human, someone up there who has opinions, who has feelings, who has a sense of humor. I feel like that's when you really connect with an audience and and not it is not easy to do. I will tell you that because, again, especially if you're a high achiever, which I imagine most of your audience is. We crave perfection. We don't want to look human. We want to seem impossibly polished. But I've found the reality is, is a lot of times that obscures your message and you become a facade of yourself instead of opening up. And that's the thing I always encourage people to do. And stand up comedy is the perfect is the perfect milieu for this, where an audience. I don't think is, I've ever heard the word stand up comedy in milieu. In you know, well, sentence. I figured, <laughs> listen, I got to use my Ivy League education and use some SAT words in here. But I think the thing I love about stand up comedy is people don't fake laughter. They can clap, they can smile, but they won't fake real laughter. And so when you're on stage, you get an audience's immediate feedback on are they. And it's not sometimes it's is the joke funny, but more what I found is are they buying what you're selling? Do mm -hmm. they feel comfortable 
with you. And that was one of the biggest lessons I took away from stand up is an audience is watching the speaker to judge how how comfortable they can be. And this is one of the things you learn in stand up. Sometimes jokes don't work. Sometimes you bring a drink on stage, you knock it over. Sometimes a waitress spills a, a tray of drinks. And if if you're unable to be present and react in the moment, the audience detects that consciously or subconsciously. And they see, wait a second, this guy, this guy isn't present. This comedian uh, isn't addressing what's in the room. They don't know what's going on. So one of the great things I've learned in stand-up comedy, a t- a, when a joke bombs, the audience pauses for a second and what they want to know is does does he know that joke wasn't funny does he know that 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 didn't land and when you acknowledge that and say whoa you know that one needed to be workshopped i'm so sorry that one i'm just gonna scratch that one out people like okay he knows and all of a sudden they feel comfortable because an audience knows when you have them in the palm of your hand like i got you i'm gonna take you on a fun journey and it's the same thing when you're giving a talk it's like letting that crowd know i got you i know what i'm doing and i know what my message is and all of a sudden then the audience can relax and receive the information receive the jokes yes yes and to just as a qualifier since you started initially or right away with the some some lessons from the stand-up world uh, in case anybody else out there is suddenly having a panic attack no we're not suggesting you necessarily do stand-up comedy no we're not suggesting you try to be the funny person if you are not inherently funny if anything do the opposite if you know that you're not necessarily an inherently funny person please don't try it's which is not to say that you can't make you know cute tongue-in-cheek lines and have a little fun here and there and there are ways to do that well but don't try to be funny if you know that's just not your that's not your jam so to speak absolutely so that's it's it goes again be authentic be who you are don't try to be someone you emulate or or you respect and in comedy when you're starting out What you're really doing is you're imitating the comedians you've seen growing up, the ones you like, the ones you admire. And you spend the first five to 10 years of your career finding your own voice and learning how you would say things. And once, once you do that, that's a really powerful place to then communicate so much more effectively because you're saying what you really believe, everything resonates and that's what the audience receives. Yes, yes. And just as a little side tip for everybody else out there, um, my line, when I do try a joke and it bombs, I just go, well, that's the last time I'm borrowing a joke from Matt Eisman. <laughs> <laughs> and the audience nods, go, yeah. So exactly, and then it. they all laugh at that and they go, oh, now I understand, Laura. Yeah, don't do that again. That was a mistake. So, and by the way, there's one other thing you said that I, I, that was present too, and I want to bring everybody else back to it, which is uh, an Ivy League education. So a little known fact about you, tell us about this. What's, what's your real, your professional, official training and background? Well, in a previous lifetime, I, I did, I went to uh, Princeton for undergrad um, and then went to Columbia Medical School and got my MD. I was doing my residency in internal medicine in Denver, Colorado. When I kind of had an epiphany, I, I realized my my heart wasn't totally in medicine and and i know a lot of people can think listen my heart's not in my job there are a lot of things you can do where you know you're grinding where you're just putting your nose to the grindstone and surviving but for me where i really struggled was someone else's life was at stake the patient's life Mm. and that's when i realized if my heart's not in this i'm not doing them uh uh the, I'm, I'm not doing them a favor and I'm not doing myself a favor. So that was when I decided I had to take a break and kind of reevaluate my life and figure out either grow up and, and come back to medicine fully invested or as it happened, walk down a completely different path. And so it really was, I didn't know I was leaving medicine to become a stand-up comedian. I knew I was taking a break from medicine. And in the interim, I thought I need to do something completely different than what I'd done my whole life, which was school, uh, studying sports, sure. just being kind of goal based and to say, I, I, I need to really stop and say, all right, w- what am I really passionate about? And I found entertainment and I, I feel so lucky that I found what I really think I was meant to do. And, and I bet you're, that was a super easy conversation to have with your parents after X number of years of Ivy League education, medical school, et cetera. I'm going to leave medicine and be a stand up comic mom. I bet that, that went uh, really well. Well, my dad was a world world renowned professor who was a professor at the University of Colorado where I was doing my training. So we were working in the same hospital to get in fact Christmas Day 
of my my internship year as a doctor, my first year, my dad was my attending physician. He was my boss for the day. So Christmas morning, he and I are in the hospital seeing patients together. Um, and he said, you know, this is one of the greatest Christmas gifts I've ever gotten. A month later, I'm sitting him down over Chinese food saying, dad, I got to take a break from this. And he took a beat when I told him I'm, I'm leaving medicine, I'm gonna try stand up comedy. And the very first thing he said was life is short, do what makes you happy. Oh, what a beautiful Christmas gift on, I, it's on I, a whole different level. It, so. it uh, I'm sure he said a lot of different things behind my back, <laughs> Laura, but, but- he had the grace to say that there. So let's- It was. Let's, and let's take a beat from here and, and redirect, because we could talk about this for another hour, but uh, yeah. we wanna make sure that we're getting down to the, the hardcore stuff here that I think everybody's really excited to hear about. and. Where I wanted to to segue and to bring together the speaking to influence space and all the entertainment lessons is looking at communication related lessons that you've learned by doing American Ninja Warrior in particular, yeah. because that's a whole space unto itself. I mean, my my son and I watched it together for years when he was in middle school and high school. What's been your absolute favorite thing about being part of that world? I, I, for for me, it really has been seeing these these athletes do something I think that even they didn't know they were capable of. And growing up, I loved sports. I still love sports. I love watching NFL football. I love watching pro sports. But what you know, when you when you watch the Super Bowl, you know, even the team that loses, all of them are still multimillionaires. They're going home to mansions. When you watch our show, and I think it's similar to the Olympics where like these people, the vast majority of them are not making any money. We've we've had two winners on our show. Uh, in 15 years mm. and every single other person has come up short and walked away with virtually nothing. So it, it, to me, it's that they motivate, that they come out here not to win money, but to to really test themselves on this course. Because what, what we found is the obstacles they overcome on the course are what we see, but what makes them impressive is the obstacles they overcome off of the course to get there. And it's it's been such a good lesson because particularly in entertainment, you see the finished product, you see what's on screen, but you don't see the decades leading up, developing the skills to be able to do that. And so the thing I love with Ninja Warriors, we see these athletes come out here who are everyday people, who have jobs, who have families, and they still find time to train and come out and with this goal of being as good as they can be. And, and the thing we've seen that I absolutely love is that hard work trumps talent on our show and that's such an important and lesson again. so let's let's go right into that because i think that sounds like a great rabbit hole for us to dive into because you know you talk in a lot of your speaking engagements uh, about lessons that you've learned from american ninja warrior um and which i believe are as you and i've discussed are fully relevant to anybody who wants to expand their reputation as a thought leader. So let's go in there with lesson number one and the idea that hard work trumps talent. So talk a little bit more about that. How does how do how can we leverage that for those who want to start working into the thought leadership space? But I, I don't like how do I get where, where do I start? What if I'm not na a natural speaker? Just where do I go? How do I use that lesson? And again, that's one of the things for people to have grace that Time and again, we hear stories of people who come on our show, who are our best competitors, who talk about the very first day they walked into the ninja gym and they couldn't do a pull-up. They couldn't get up the warped wall. They, they, they talk so often about what they couldn't do and how they failed and failed and failed. But gradually, when they put the time in, we saw them grow and have success. And I think one of the, one of the unique things about Ninja Warrior has been that this community really embraces that idea of we 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 are all putting in this work together and we've had olympic athletes olympic gold medalists come out professional athletes nfl linebackers come out people who've been at the top of the mountain in their fields and they didn't none of them has hit a buzzer on ninja warrior and so when i say hard work trumps talent it's really not just working hard in general it's working towards a specific goal because a lot of these people thought the work they'd put in in other areas would carry them through on Ninja Warrior. But what we found was this is a slightly different skill set. Even though it's still athletic, if they hadn't trained obstacles, if they hadn't put in the hard work on the obstacles, they wouldn't do well. And the prime example we have is our most successful ninja ever is a 34-year-old father of three who's a weatherman in Connecticut, Joe Moravsky. 
his sports experience before he got into Ninja Warrior was in high school, he played soccer on the JV team. And then about 15, about 12 years ago, he discovered Ninja Warrior and he said he became obsessed. Now, again, a father, kids, a full job. He was getting up early in the morning and working late at night. And now Joe Morovsky, this unassuming guy, when you look at him, 5'9", 155 pounds, he's hit more buzzers than any other athlete we've ever had on the show mm -hmm. because he's put that work in. So how and can we leverage that to doing things like getting more speaking opportunities or, or finding podcasts? How do we, how do we do that? So I think the thing is, is first of all, have some grace with yourself. But one of the things that I learned very early in my career that I think has really, really served me very well is say yes to everything. Say yes to every opportunity you get, no matter how small, no matter if there's no pay, if it's something that is leading you towards what your ultimate goal is, um, you need to take those opportunities because um, this is what we say in stand-up comedy to get better. This is what we see out of the ninjas to get better. You have to put the reps in. You have to actually do what you want to do. If it's speaking, find opportunities to go to a rotary club, to go to your kid's school, to give these talks in areas where the stakes aren't quite as high where you can still start to practice because you can practice in front of your mirror for for weeks but there's something different about actually stepping into a real game time situation and being in front of a crowd and saying all right now let me do what i've been practicing let me show all the work i've been putting in and for me, I know, like, I, I had some teenage kids who started a podcast in their spare time, and, and they were like, would, would you do an interview? I'm like, of course, I would love to do an interview. Because for me, it's an opportunity to maybe reach a new audience. For me, these kids could all of a sudden become the next Joe Rogan, and I could have gotten into the ground level. Or at the very least, it's another opportunity, though, to try to speak to, a, to an audience, a, a little different audience, a younger kind of teen sports related audience. But I find that when you when you show up authentically yourself, the messages resonate. And, and I think that that's what you find with the hard work. That's what you find with taking these opportunities. Because as you're, I, I find as you say things, again and again, you become more attuned to what the actual, what is that nugget of a message? What exactly are you trying to say? And so th this is one of the things I've noticed in stand-up comedy. You'll have an idea of a joke and you'll go up on stage and you'll say it and it doesn't quite work. And so sometimes you can spend months, sometimes years to figure out how do I say this one statement so that 300 people in a room from different backgrounds, from different ages, different cultures, different classes, how I can get them all on the same page at the same time. So you find you have this effective idea in your head. The goal is to say, how do I get everyone else to understand exactly what I'm saying? Yes. And I think that comes with, with just taking the reps and and getting feedback. And so I record all my stand-up comedy sets and you'll listen and say, wow, I thought that joke did better. I, it's not, it's not landing. So maybe I need to find a way to say things a little differently to refine my message. And that's so important, the idea of recording yourself, whether you're recording your practices or whether you're recording your, your actual performances, virtual, in person or otherwise, get the video, bring a camera with you, ask somebody else to do it, bring yes. a little tripod with a little gorilla hand or something to clamp your iPhone to a chair or a table and just ask somebody else to hit record while you're doing your thing because you know what you intend to do. You know how it feels in the moment, but when you watch it later, you're going to get real clear. I mean, I certainly do. And look, I've seen myself on video so many times. I'm sure you have too. Like you get tired of your own face after a while, <laughs> right? <laughs> but it's still valuable. And you may never love staring at yourself on video. You know, I'm not suggesting you'll eventually overcome that particular hurdle, but boy, it gives clarity about what really landed and what doesn't and just helps you to constantly refine there's always a need you can always get better and i think that's the beauty of wanting to stay at the edge of your uh, you know the cutting edge of your craft 
You make, you make a very good point. When I said I record my sets, I, I, I've gotten a little lazy where I do just audio record now. But starting out, I, re, I did video record because what, you, what I found, which was startling, was the amount of nervous tics I had. Yes when I was starting out, when I was speaking on stage, uh, things where I would, you know, f flick the microphone cord or just wasn't making eye contact at times. And when you watch the video and it, believe me, it was painful. We always had a rule, nothing within 24 hours, give it time to settle so you could be a little more objective, but it's a great skill to be able to review yourself on video and stop being s critical um, in a negative way, but to start being, uh, perceptive and to, to be a, a great judge of your own performances. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I always tell people you can, you can assume the position when you watch yourself on video, which is this meaning like sit there and cover your face and only allow with your hands and just sort of peek with one eyeball through a couple of fingers as you're staying. It's okay to do that. Bring popcorn, bring whatever you want. But uh, I like your, your recommendation of waiting 24 hours. Be, give yeah. us a little bit of space between rec making the recording and watching the recording so you have a little more objectivity and you can bring the heart rate down a little bit, but just take it for what it's worth. The video camera is your best friend who has no filter whatsoever, no verbal filter at least. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so and, and podcasts too, like taking opportunities to go on because one of the things I find if you're kind of searching for your message very often on a podcast, people are going to tell you what they want to hear from you. And, and so it's really helpful when you go on and you do a podcast to kind of listen to it later and say, all right, what were their questions? What, what were they curious about? So rather than saying, oh, I'm going to throw a dart because I believe this is what people want to hear about. Sometimes that works, but sometimes you let the, you let your audience kind of give you, give you the guidance of, well, here are our questions. Here's what we're curious about. Yes. Yes. Okay. So lesson number two, what's another major lesson that you've learned from doing so, this? <laughs> this one, th this was a really interesting one that I think will, will really uh, be difficult for some of your audience to accept. But on Ninja Warrior, the thing we've learned is falling isn't failing. And when you see our show, again, we've had two winners in the previous 14 seasons that have wow. aired which meant every single other athlete season ended with the fall. And when you watch an episode, the vast majority of, of con contestants fall, they fall in the water. It feels like this is a show that'll be filled with failure, but when you watch it, you realize people can succeed in so many different ways. And that's, that's a lesson that's very hard because so often we are in this zero sum mindset of there can be one CEO, there can be one top earner, there can be one top salesperson. And if I'm not it, second place is for losers. And instead of the idea of, of, of having that grace to say that with every stumble, with every step where I come up short, as long as I'm learning, as long as I'm improving, as long as I am taking from my mistakes, you are growing. And we've seen that time and again where our athletes, and it's been one of the beautiful things with Ninja Warrior where all the athletes now, this community has really come to accept that fact and that these kids, you know, will come into a gym when they, you know, in baseball, when you strike out, you kind of slump back to the dugout, your head down. In Ninja Warrior, you'll see these athletes picking each other up, go, hey, you fell. Let's go back. Let's do it again. Let's keep growing. Let's, let's, let's take this opportunity where everything didn't go right and say, all right, well, what will I do the next time to be better? Um, so what and can so, people take in this then for, for those who are aspiring speakers in whatever context, falling isn't failing. How, how can that help us become better speakers, become more effective go-to thought leaders? Well, what it does is it, I think it gives you permission sometimes to experiment, to explore, to, to take a risk, to do something where you're like, this is what I'm really feeling. I, I it, it, it's, it's something that I haven't seen another speaker do, but I, I think the, the key to the key though to accepting that falling isn't failing is to to give yourself permission to fall because one of the things uh, that i know your audience will relate to is we will script our talks word for word and we will practice them we will rehearse them and if you listen to it unless that speaker is incredibly gifted you'll hear someone reading a script yeah and we can sense that and it might still be an impactful message, but it doesn't resonate when someone's reading their words as opposed to when someone is speaking. 
uh, speaking from the heart. And again, you might still have scripted it, but one of the things I've, I found, because again, coming from a medical background where you needed to be perfect, I my stand-up when I started out, I would script every single word, every beat, every pause. And when I would go up, my goal was to recite it exactly that way where it was almost a performance. But there was no room for authenticity. There was no room for spontaneity. There, there were times when I'm like, I would forget what 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 was actually funny about this. I would forget what was the message I was trying to convey. And one of the things that 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 I really realized that speakers need to know is we write differently than we speak. Amen to that. And we often write as we are highly educated, as you're writing a thesis, you know, heretofore unknown, my <laughs> hypothesis shall be. But you realize when you're speaking to someone trying to convey this information, you're speaking, especially when you can speak to someone as a friend and say, well, this is how I would say this. This is what I would say this lesson is, is I want people to, to have an idea of what they're saying and to have a bullet point, but then trust this is where you're the expert. If you're talking about this topic, trust that you know it. You can have a script with the bullet points of what you want to get out, what the key points an are. Outline, an outline. An outline. And once you are able to do that, and, and the crazy thing is we feel like, but, but what if I forget? What if I have to look down? Okay. So you look That's down. all right. It goes back to what I said with the audience. As long as you're cool with it going, oh, I lost my place. Let me take a look. Okay, here it is. This, well, this, this was my next point. The audience is fine with that. I have seen that time and again, where the audience actually goes, okay, this is real. This isn't just scripted. This isn't a performance. This is someone speaking to me. And I just find that that connection uh, is such, and it takes time. It does take time. It takes practice because so often when you start to feel uncomfortable or you see maybe the audience isn't paying attention, you just resort back to your script. You just resort back to those words. And that's when I invite people to say, you know what? Let me just try to talk. Let me just try to speak as the expert on this topic as it comes to me. Um, and if it doesn't go well, it's still a lesson learned to give yourself that permission. Um, but it is, it is without a doubt, I have seen it, and not just in entertainment and corporate talks. I'm sure you've seen it in effective CEOs. We see it in politicians. You can feel when someone's reading and you can feel when someone's speaking to you. Yes, yes, what's from the heart versus from the page. That's, uh, I find that more often than not, when someone tries to read their script, they, or memorize their script, they inevitably sound like a fifth grader trying to read their, what I did on my oh, summer vacation. Yes, okay. yes. You know, and it's the, when people try to memorize it, I often hear clients say, but it's so hard to memorize. You know, I don't know why I can't remember it. And I'm going, because it's not your words, it's your writing, but that's yeah. not actually what you would have said if you were speaking extemporaneously. So I don't know, you could tell me if you've got any other tips along these lines, but I find that what works for me is um, sort of reverse engineering a script of sorts and starting, like I'll just take my, my phone and open up my voice memo app, hit record, and I'll just walk around the house or walk around the yard or something and just babble into it. Because when you go back later on, it's a hot mess, but there's going to be places where you go, okay, that topic was interesting, but I got to get it down from six minutes to two. Or I really, really, really liked the way that came out. That I just nailed that one supernaturally. That one I'm going to write out and see where it came because that was my exact words. And if I, that'll be easier for me to remember because it is natural for me. It's my 100%. method. hundred percent. Otter AI is fantastic. It mm. does voice to text, even Siri. It's gotten pretty amazing if you go into the notes app and that's exactly what I do. When we say, when we talk about, Hey, you got to sit down and write your talk. I find that is, that is not what you should do. You should not sit down and start typing at a computer because again, you're going to be writing it. You're going to be speaking with the grammatical flourishes, with the compound sentences. When you're speaking into your phone, you're really finding the ideas yourself. And that's, and that's also how I rehearse, is I will just start walking and I'll give my talk and I'll learn it that way. And if I have to look at the script to get a place where I am with the bullet point, okay, resume back going on saying it now the other thing i do from medicine we learned a lot of memory tricks i use a lot of mnemonic devices where i will create create visual images to kind of link my talk so that because the other thing i do is i've had instances where i've gone in with a powerpoint i have media that accompanies my talks computer didn't work but they need to talk and all of a sudden i'm like wow there are no notes here 
And so that was one of those worst case scenario situations, but where I'd rehearsed enough where I'm like, I know this talk. I panic for a second. All of a sudden I'm like, this is, this is my talk. These are my words. Yes. So I think that the more you can practice speaking it, the more you'll, you'll find exactly what you want to say. And the more you'll find your voice. Yes. I did a, a dinner keynote at an event at this restaurant that was some sort of old converted barn in an old hotel and whatever else it was. And we had this big room, but a relatively smaller group of people kind of in the center. They brought in the the projector, they brought in the the screen, they brought in everything else. And we looked around and we realized there wasn't one outlet in the whole room. <laughs> <laughs> so Whoop. no power. We're like, yeah. oh, okay. So uh, unplugged it is. This Let's, here we go. You know, you just, you can never totally know what to expect in that and and it really just becomes a game of pivot can you for the most overused word in the past couple of years yeah uh, at least since the pandemic and whatnot but uh, yeah you, you've got to know your stuff and you got to be comfortable and here's with the other it. thing and too is perfect the audience is going to know hey this is this is not the normal circumstances they give you grace the audience knows all right this person's operating without a net they're human they're they're not expecting perfection right but to that end that idea of kind of planning for operating without a net i know we said there are a lot of people who don't want to be funny who should never be funny but if there are people who really want to get a crash course on what i think was some of the best training i had for being prepared for not just stand-up comedy but for public speaking for hosting to be able to operate in any situation i, I would highly encourage people uh to take an improv class mm. now it's not because you're going to be doing improv or being on whose line is it anyway but with improv what you learn is you have to be comfortable walking out on stage not knowing what's going to happen yeah and when you get this suggestion it's this idea of the the key to good improv is not planning it's listening mm. it's listening to the other person and then reacting in that situation and it is so uncomfortable as someone who did stand up, who was used to knowing, I know every word I'm going to say, to go out on stage and go, I have no idea what's about to happen and to leap into it. But for me, that made me so confident. And it's not like I'm a great improviser, but what it taught me is if I'm in a situation in stand up, if I'm in a situation hosting live shows, I've done, we hosted a, a History Channel's largest live show ever in las vegas when travis pastrana was recreating evil knievel's jumps and we we walked through the script once and they're like okay you're live for three hours go and that so it was one of those things of going you know what i know i can talk and i know i can listen to someone in my ear and i can make it work but it was that idea of because i'm comfortable where i've had things go wrong i've had that idea of operating without a net so for people who are looking to jumpstart this kind of the the growth, I think you need to be a little more comfortable. Improv teaches you, and that's the skill you have in a talk. When when the projector cuts out, when when you skip a slide, when when something else pops up, to be able to say, okay, let me react in this moment and be authentic. So improv, I think, is a great sort of sort of uh, uh, cold water plunge to, to start <laughs> boosting your ability to, because once you've done that and you go into a talk where you're like, I do have a script, I have my safety net. I think it just gives you a different level of confidence to say, hmm. I can handle anything that happens today. Nice. And remember the, the class, if you do take it, nobody has to know. It's just there for you. So that's, right. uh, yeah, no need to out yourself on that one. You can use it as a tool for later on. All right, we've got just real quick, let's do one more lesson. What's another lesson from uh, American Ninja Warrior? So the, the craziest lesson, and again, this kind of goes back to that idea of the zero sum game of being the best. But on our show, what we found is our show is not about being the best. The show is really about being your best. And we found this when we started out on the show, there's a million dollar prize if you win it. We were certain like on any other reality show, even The Bachelorette, when they're competing for love, people get competitive and there can only be one winner. On our show, as we said, people are falling all the time. But we found we really, this lesson was driven home in our season seven, the first time we had someone win, Isaac called Yarrow, world-class rock climber. He made it look easy. At the end of the season, when we went back and looked at the data, looked at the social media, the one, the guy who won, the first guy to win the million dollars, the first guy to do this impossible task, he wasn't in the top 20 most popular ninjas. <laughs> but the woman who was atop it was Casey Catanzaro, this five her. foot tall girl who was the first woman to get up a warped wall. 
And she did it at 95 pounds. When she did it, she was in 21st place that night. She wasn't the best ninja that night, but she was her best. And that's what the audience responds to. And it's, it's this idea again of, I think it's very challenging, particularly for people in business where there's such an obvious hierarchy so often to, to give yourself permission to say, I'm really, it's, it's, it's not, I'm not competing with them. I'm competing with myself to be the best version of myself and to give yourself credit for that. Um, and, and how so can, how can we do that in the speaking stages? What are some ways that so, we can work on being the best version of ourselves? Stop comparing yourself to other speakers mm. is one thing, because so often I think we'll have an idea of who your favorite speaker is and going, I want to sound like them. And when you're starting out, especially you're not, you're going to sound like not, you're probably not even going to sound like yourself. You're going to sound in a rough version, but it's this idea of, of being able to, to say, am I better than I was before? A am I growing? Am I headed on the right trajectory? Um, and I think the idea of, of having that confidence when you stop comparing yourself or saying, this isn't going the way I anticipated, instead of pointing out the negatives, focusing on the positives, like, you know what, that was, that was a good message. I delivered that well. Um, so I think the idea about just constantly improving and giving yourself the grace to say, Hey, I am, I am proceeding on my pace. And as long as I'm headed in the right direction, that's a victory. Yes. And, and you know, it's interesting because we can't help, but notice others and we should, and perhaps to, to, especially for those who are just starting out in some ways, pay attention more to other speakers because you can get ideas from them. It's like, Oh, yes. that was really smart. The way they handled this. Yes. That was really interesting how they opened that uh, opportunity or they started that conversation or they responded to this challenging question. Those are good tactics that I can learn from, that I can borrow from their role models in this new space. And if they've yes. been doing it a long time, why not learn from them? It's not copying. It's not stealing. It, it's learning good tactics, just like you would do as a doctor. You oh, a hundred percent. But it's, and you know, the key though is too, is to be able to start to discern and say, so for instance, when Casey's on the course at five feet tall, uh, we have a guy who's six, seven out there. Now she could watch him go through the course and see him go through an obstacle and could take some ideas, but for her frame, it may be physically impossible. She may need to embrace other things. So when you watch a speaker going up there, it's important to say, all right, is this person similar to me? Do they have a similar energy? Because if you're watching someone who's diametrically opposed to you and going, wow, I love what they're doing, there are things you can take from them, but there are other things where, and you'll see this in comedy, where you think of a guy who's super high energy, like Robin Williams, oh, ah, oh, ah, look at this. Oh, <laughs> this is amazing. High energy. So, right. right, and then you see a guy like Dave Chappelle, mm -hmm. and you realize both of them are legendary comics, but when Chappelle's up there, He's very laconic, very slow. He brings the audience to him. Mm. And you see, wow, there are different ways to accomplish the same goal. So I think the key is going, it's not just who you like. It's not who, oh, I respond to them. I want to be like them. It's who's like you, who has your energy, your sensibility, but is still a very effective communicator. Yeah. I feel when you find them, you can glean a lot more because it's really going to be more suited to you. Yes, yes. Learn from everybody, but there are so there's so much variety out yeah. there, and just to start paying attention to all because you're hearing people speak all the time in live, virtual, pre-recorded, in the moment, etc. So uh, such great ideas, uh, Matt. I would love to continue this conversation. Unfortunately, I need to wrap this up. So <laughs> for those who are just completely sucked into this at the moment and going, I want more. Where can people go to learn more? Well, social media, I have a website, matteisman.com, M-A-T-T-I-S-E-M-A-N. And that's also my user handle across Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter. Um, I'm always uh, out there listening. Um, and, and the other thing is like, I love, I love interacting with people. I love interacting with people from podcasts, from comedy, from Ninja, whatever it is. It's always great to hear from people. Um, so, and follow me. I'll be sharing everything that's the latest. I'm doing a whole bunch of stand up coming up this summer so people can check it out. Fabulous. Well, this has been so much fun. Thank you for joining us today, Matt. Thanks, Laura. Had a blast. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. As always, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode if you're joining us for the first time today. And of course, don't forget to give us a five star rating on Apple Podcasts or your 
favorite platform of choice. We can help even more people to increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And finally, if you want to download my free guide for equipment recommendations for virtual influence, including my picks for microphones, lights, and more, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Socola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.